Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. This week was exciting. A lot of really great science, and I thought, what a great opportunity to stop talking about measles. <laughs> but no, <laughs> measles is still all over the place, so we got to spend a little time talking about measles, and we'll get to some science later. But um, first of all, TEFI, you know, Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute, has all that wastewater analysis. I have a cold. Everybody I know has a cold. And the reason is we have four rampant cold viruses for adults. Metanumavirus, influenza B, parainfluenza, and parvovirus, all very high. And also rotavirus, which is a GI virus. <laughs> Nobody wants to get that. Uh, anyway, so lots of people around I know have colds. I, got, I went to Washington, D.C., shook a lot of hands. Next thing you know, I'm, I've got an upper respiratory infection. Uh, so, measles. Can't get away from it. Uh, they're up to 712 cases in the United States. 32% uh, under the age of 5, 38% under the age of 20, and 28%, pretty large known, are 20 plus. So that's surprising. 11% hospitalized and three measles deaths. Um, if you look at the number of cases per week, you can see a real huge peak. And if you look at yearly, we haven't gotten back to 2019, but I bet we do get there. This is 2025, 2019. We're probably going to exceed that. And of course, Texas leads the way. Most of the cases are in Texas and New Mexico with a smattering of cases all over the place. And if you look at where they are, they are mostly in Gaines County, that's that orange, and uh, Lubbock and Terry County was the other one. But we, we, in the wastewater, we did see a big increase in Lubbock. You can see these are positive for measles signals. We had a couple of cases in Houston. We picked that up in wastewater. And then also a case or two in El Paso. So that's all being picked up by the wastewater analysis. If you look at the Texas cases, uh, most of them are under the age of uh, 17. So 175 between 0 and 4, uh, 206 cases between 5 and 17. The vast majority unvaccinated. There are only 11 cases of the total 561 that have had one or two doses of vaccine. Again, very consistent with the incredibly effective 97 to 98% efficacy. And I show this every time. Remember, we eliminated measles as a disease in the year 2000 once we were above 95% vaccination rate and we're dealing with a disease and three children's deaths that are totally preventable. That, that's the tragedy. It's totally preventable. So my sister asked me, well, what about Vitamin A and castor oil. And I said, are you kidding me? But that's not appropriate. So I said, let me, let's look at the data. So for those of you who are not familiar with the vitamin industry, it is a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, the FDA does not usually approve supplements like that. It can't step in and regulate manufacturing, labeling, and marketing, but generally doesn't do too much of that. And I will just tell you point blank, there is... <laughs> Generally, no need for vitamin supplements and you have, unless you have a very specific reason to do so, like a specific vitamin deficiency, vitamin D or vitamin A. If you have a deficiency, it makes a difference. Now, there are two sort of big groups of vitamins. They're the water-soluble vitamins. That is vitamin C and all the B vitamins. They're usually pretty non-toxic because they're, they're not stored. They, they dissolve in water and they're excreted by the kidneys. But the ones that are stored in fat... Uh, vitamin A, D, E, and K, those are, are the reason they're stored in fat is so they can be used long term. So for example, classic vitamin D, you have a lot of vitamin D in the summer when there's sun out, it's stored in fat and then it's used uh, as needed in the winter time when, when there's less uh, sun. The trouble with fat stored uh, vitamins is they're also very likely to become toxic because you can store uh, a large amounts. Now the castor oil thing is really Weird, because it doesn't have a lot of vitamins, maybe a little bit of vitamin E, but that's about it. Uh, so the, if you pick up a vitamin bottle in the drugstore, you'll see something called UL, and that is what's considered the tolerable upper intake level, the upper level that you can tolerate. But that's not the, the level you should be at. That's the level that you begin to see toxicity. So the UL on a, on a vitamin bottle is actually meant to inform you that, that you get into excess levels. And people can get toxicity before those levels. So 
What's the thing about vitamin A? Well, it turns out if you have vitamin A deficiency, and people who have vitamin A deficiency, their immune function is not as good as it should be. And so if in those people who have vitamin A deficiency, giving them vitamin A will restore their immune response. There's no evidence whatsoever that supplemental vitamin A, once you have normal vitamin A, does anything over and above the normal immune response. So casserole and vitamin A, there's no evidence that that's effective for anything, much less measles. Whereas the vaccine is 97 to 98% effective. The other thing is vitamin A toxicity occurs quite a lot, especially in children. And the, the, the toxicity is joint pain, headaches, hair loss, muscle pain, vision loss. Some ch children have reported to get even go comatose, and there have been deaths responsible from uh, vitamin A over, over, overdosing. Retinol, which is very used, commonly used to treat skin disease and psoriasis, is, can be a source of vitamin A toxicity. Vitamin E, which has been in castor oil, Vitamin E is, uh, is an important vitamin. Uh, it comes in eight different forms as you eat it naturally, but in supplements, it's almost all synthetic alpha tocopherol form, which has a much higher risk profile and doesn't do as much. Vitamin E is important for uh, managing free radicals in the body, and it, it, it is an important vitamin if it's, if it's at normal levels. Excess vitamin E has been shown to even increase a number of diseases, including prostate cancer. So there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't be taking excessive supplements of vitamins, particularly fat vitamins, and there's no evidence that castor, castor oil or vitamin A is useful for the treatment of things like measles. So one interesting thing, a couple, there are a couple of reviews on vitamins. Uh, the drug, the FDA usually uh, does not get involved with most of the vitamins, but they can if they need to. But there have been a number of unfounded claims that have been shown in labels uh, mis misrepresenting the, uh, the actual ingredients of the bottle. And according to one recent study, of the 57 dietary supplements that they, were, that they had on the bottle, 84% did not contain the amount of ingredients that they said, and 40% did not even have the ingredients at all. So it's, when you walk in and get supplements that you know, you're just, you're just taking chances. And they're very effective treatments for measles. It's called a vaccine. All right. So on to the interesting science. So th this was really a, a, a great week of, <laughs> of science. So, you know, we talked a, a couple of weeks ago or the last few weeks about taking mini pigs and genetically altering them so that they can be used as organ donors for, for people, particularly kidney, and there was one liver. Uh, and so, you know, this really interesting uh, genetic manipulation of animals. Well, this is one that's, that came out, was in the popular press, New York Times. Remember the dire wolves of the Games of Thrones, those big white giant wolves? Well, they went extinct about 13,000 years ago. And there is a team of scientists that were able to a extract DNA from fossils of a tooth of a dire wolf and a 72,000 year old uh, skull of the dire wolf, particularly this particular bone in here uh, near the, the mandible. And what they did was uh, compare the dire wolf genome to gray wolves, which are the common wolves around now, and they found that there were about 20 genes or so that were significantly different. 99.5% of the genome is exactly the same as a gray wolf, but 20 or so uh, are, are different. So there's a company, <laughs> I don't can't believe they, they do this, but there's a company they decided they would start de-extinction, their, their, their word, de-extinction of animals. So they looked at these 20 different genes, and they picked five of them, and they put them into a gray wolf background, and they came up with what they're calling dire wolves. And they looked, they're white, <laughs> and they're named Romulus, Remus, and of course Khaleesi after Game of Thrones. <clears throat> now, the reality, though, is that they're not really dire wolves. They're 99.9% .9 gray wolves with two or three genes added. Uh, so when you think about, I mean, the gymnastics of doing this for, for what purpose other than <laughs> de I mean, I don't even know what de extinction means. There are reasons why animals go extinct. Bringing them back, especially uh, maybe like Jurassic Park, bring all the dinosaurs back. Probably not wise for us to do. But if, if anybody does it, it's gonna be that company. I don't know. I think it was an investment opportunity, that's what I think. 
But think about doing that, which is compared to doing something like altering genes for transplant and xenotransplant makes it makes a big difference. Another though really interesting study. This is a this is a, 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 a fascinating study. It was published in Nature just last week. Almost a natural experiment that was done uh, in whales. So they they started a vaccination program against herpes zoster, the thing that caused shingles, chicken pox, and shingles. And the reason this is interesting is this particular virus, uh, the zoster virus, lives dormant in nerves for a long time. This is why when you get older, you can be reactivated and you get shingles. But they did an interesting thing in Wales. They started a vaccination program against the herpes zoster on September 1, 2013, very specific date. And anyone that turned 79 on that date could get a vaccine for a year. And then the next year, that's when you're 78 and then turned 79 on September 1, 2013, you also got vaccinated. So they had this cohort of people who, starting 2013, 79 years old, would get vaccinated in, you know, each year. But that meant everybody who was older than September 1, 2013, 79 year plus a day, did not get vaccinated. So it's an unbelievably interesting control group. So here's a group that got vaccinated. One day difference and older, they, uh, they were not vaccinated. And there was a difference in the onset of dementia by about uh, three and a half percent or, or a 20% relative reduction. This to me is remarkable because it's the first time showing that vaccination against a neurotropic virus might have a role to play in, in preventing dementia, suggesting that the neurotropic viruses might have a role in dementia. So this is really kind of a fascinating study, really well done uh, observational study. It doesn't prove anything, but one more opportunity to understand the many causes of dementia. So it's a fascinating study. And there are several other studies I couldn't get to because of measles. Anyway, we'll get to those later. Uh, so today I want to end with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, this week we celebrated the topping out of the Lilly and Roy Cohen Tower that will house Baylor School of Medicine and School of Health Professions. This is the first phase of our developing the Michael E. DeBakey Health Sciences Park at, in the McNair campus. Big thank you to all the people who participate, all the donors who have made it possible. It's a really exciting, beautiful building. Can't wait to move in. Should be done in, in 2026. Also, congratulations to Dr. Eric Sturgis, Professor of Otolaryngology, who was recently inducted into the LSU College of Science Hall of Distinction. This is an honor that recognizes alumni mentorship, research, and philanthropic contr contributions and support for future scientists. Uh, then, a shout out to Dr. Yudan Gao, an assistant professor of neuroscience and a McNair scholar, is one of the 19 recipients of pilot award funding from the uh, Simons Foundation for Autism Research. Uh, doctor, uh, these awards support novel, high-risk, and exploratory projects that have the potential to yield transformative results in autism, uh, autism research. We have one of the best groups for doing autism research, the genetics of autism, anywhere in the world. So congratulations to Dr. Gao. And finally, many people are celebrating Passover, which began on April 12th and concludes, concludes April 20th. This year, Easter also falls on April 20th. So whether you're celebrating Passover, Easter, or just hanging out with the family, have a have a wonderful and blessed time together. I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>